Good morning and welcome to this, the 31st and final meeting of uh, 2017 of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee. Uh, can we make sure that all electronic, electronic devices are on silent and off the table, please? Um, and we have apologies this morning from our colleague, Annie Wells. Um, agenda item one is um, to take agenda item four in private. Are we content to do that? Yeah, yeah thank you very much. Agenda item two is one of our two substantive uh, uh, issues this morning, and it's the Gender Representation and Public Boards Scotland Bill. Uh, I'd like to welcome the Cabinet Secretary, Angela Constance, MSP. Um, Angela is the Cabinet Secretary for Social Communities, Social Security and Equalities, and uh, the Minister currently in charge of this bill. Our aim is to complete stage two consideration this morning, so be mindful of that. Um, and before we move on to consideration for amendments, I think it would be helpful if I set out the procedure for stage two. Everyone should have with them a copy of the bill, as introduced, the marshal list of amendments that was published on Monday, and the groupings of amendments which sets out the amendments in the order in which they will be debated. There will be one debate on each group of amendments, and I will call the member who lodged the first amendment in each group to speak to and move their amendment, and then to speak to all of the other amendments in that group. So, members who have not lodged amendments in the group, but who wish to speak, should indicate to me in the usual way. If the Cabinet Secretary has not already spoken on the group, I will then invite her to contribute to the debate just before I move to the winding up speech. As with a debate in the Chamber, the member who is winding up on a group may take interventions from other members if they so wish. The debate on each group will be concluded by me inviting the member who moved the First Amendment in the group to wind up. Following debate on each group, I will check whether the member who moved the First Amendment in the group wishes to press their amendment or to a vote or to withdraw it. If they wish to press ahead, I will put the question on that amendment. If a member wishes to withdraw their amendment after it has been moved, they must seek the committee's agreement to do so. If any committee member objects, the, member must, the committee must immediately move to the vote on the amendment. If any member does not want to move their amendment when I call it, they should say not moved. Please remember, that any other MSP may move such an amendment. If no one moves the amendment, I will immediately call the next amendment on the marshal list. Only committee members are allowed to vote in stage two. Voting in any division is by a show of hands, and it's important that members keep their hands clearly raised until the clerk has recorded the vote. The committee is required to indicate formally that it is considered and agreed each section of the bill. Uh, each section of the schedule and schedule of the bill, and so I will put a question on each at the appropriate point. So, moving on to um, the stage two as uh, agreed. So, um, the first uh, section that we have is to call amendment. To, oh, sorry. There we go. Already is a question that section one of the bill be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, Section two of the bill, the meaning of women. So I call the amendment 10 in the name of Mary Fee, which is in a group of its own. Mary Fee is to move and speak to amendment 10. Mary. Thank you, convener. Amendment 10 in my name seeks to alter the current definition of women in the bill to ensure that the legislation is as inclusive as possible. The amendment guarantees that people who have the protected characteristic of gender reassignment, who live as a woman, are proposing to undergo, are undergoing or have undergone the process of becoming a woman. Without this amendment, the inclusivity of this bill would be limited. The current definition of woman in the draft bill only covers trans women with a full gender recognition certificate. The Gender Recognition Certificate enables trans people to be legally recognised in their affirmed gender and to be issued with a new birth certificate. However, it is also worth noting that not all trans people choose to apply for a Gender Recognition Certificate, as the certificate is not required for individuals to change their gender markers at work or to legally change their gender and other documentation, including UK passports. Passage of Amendment 10 would ensure that the Gender Representation on Public Board Scotland Bill promotes equality and inclusivity by adopting this broad definition of a woman, recognising that not all trans women possess a Gender Recognition Certificate. Thank you, 
very much. Uh, Mary, any other members wish to contribute to the debate? No, content. Cabinet Secretary, welcome. Would, would you like to contribute this morning? Uh, yes, indeed, Convener. Uh, thank you very much. And if I could start by uh, thanking the committee for its consideration of the bill. Uh, during stage one, I have found the engagement between committee members uh, and the Scottish Government to be very helpful uh, and to be constructive. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that I wanted to ensure the committee was fully appraised uh, of the Government's intentions at stage two, uh, as outlined in my letter uh, to committee uh, last week. Uh, at the end of our session this morning, uh, I'm confident that we'll have a bill that is better and stronger than that with, with which we started. And I also very much welcome the cooperation of both Alex Cole Hamilton uh, and Mary Fee in regard to the amendments uh, in their name, and I am pleased to be supporting uh, them today. Um, convener, um, I'm sure uh, that many of us will agree that it quite simply isn't acceptable that in 2007 women continue to be underrepresented uh, in decision-making positions uh, across Scotland, including uh, in the boardroom. And what this bill seeks to redress uh, to, re to uh, redress this underrepresentation on Scotland's uh, public uh, boards and lock in the gains that have been made to date, ensuring uh, that women's voices are heard uh, where it um, matters. And while the bill is not a panacea for all aspects of women's uh, inequality, however, it is absolutely the right thing to do uh, and the smart thing to do. And if this bill can be a catalyst for the equal representation uh, of women in other decision-making spaces, then I'm, uh, for one, all for that. So turning now to Mary Fee's uh, Amendment 10. Uh, convener, we've worked uh, with Mary Fee to ensure that this amendment uh, realises the policy intent and is within the competence uh, of this parliament. And I would uh, very much like to thank Mary Fee for her work uh, on uh, this area with us. She has advocated passionately uh, throughout stage one that the bill should be inclusive of trans women. And this has always been the Scottish Government's uh, intention too. Uh, and I would also uh, like to put on record my thanks to the Scottish Trans Alliance who have afforded the Scottish Government their time, uh, their expertise and their support, not just in relation uh, to this bill, but more generally too, uh, and it's greatly appreciated. So uh, I am pleased, therefore, that we have reached the point that we have today uh, of having a, a suitable amendment which will make sure uh, that when we talk about women in the bill, that includes trans women. So, convener, to confirm uh, that I support the amendment in Mary Fee's name. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Mary Fee, to, to wind up, and in your winding up, can you move yes, the amendment and um, uh, tell me whether you're going to press or withdraw? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Convener. I'm grateful to the comments from the, the, the Cabinet Secretary, <coughs> and can I thank her for the <coughs> excuse me for the help and support that she's she's given me, and and also I think it's um, it's helpful to put on record the help and support that the Trans Alliance has also um, given me. I have no further comments um, to make other than that. Um, I'll move the amendment in my name and, and press the amendment. Press the amendment. So the question is, Amendment 10 be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. Yeah, thank you very much. The question is, that Section 2 be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. Yeah. <coughs> thank you. Um, so Schedule 1 is, I now call Amendment 2 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and a group of its own. Cabinet Secretary to, to move and speak to Amendment 2. <coughs> Thank you, Convener. Uh, amendment 2 is a, a technical amendment which adds a small number of members who are nominated to the boards of regional transport partnerships to the excluded positions in Schedule 1. Uh, this is consistent with the exclusion of nominated positions on the boards of other public authorities covered uh, by the Bill. And I move and encourage members to support Amendment 2. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Any members want to contribute to the debate? No? Cabinet Secretary, I ask you to wind up and press your amendment. I'll just press the amendment, please. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. So the question is, amendment two be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you very much. The question is that schedule one be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that section three be agreed? Are we all agreed? Um, section four is I call amendment one in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton and a group of its own. Um, Alex Cole Hamilton can I ask you to move and speak to amendment one. Thank you, convener. I'm very proud to move amendment one in my name. Um, I, can I also put on my record my thanks to the Scottish Government, special advisors and the build team uh, for their collaboration in this and in open discussion and the access they gave me uh, in compiling this. Um, 
the the reasons behind my submission of Amendment 1 was to, uh, I think, increase the strength of Section 4, because right now, uh, as it stood, I believed that um, the tiebreak situation as defined in Section 4, whereby uh, two equally qualified candidates, one of whom was a woman, um, that the reasoning for allowing an appointing person to give the, the job to the person who was not a woman um, at the, was based on the idea that there was a characteristic particular to that individual. Now, we legislate in this place, and we must do so uh, with a view to less enlightened times ahead. And I th thought that it was important to delineate what exactly we meant by characteristics in that regard. I think it's very fa it's fair to say that um, the intent of the bill and the bill team was that this characteristic was specifically to improve the diversity of the board or, or some specific uh, relevant factor which might increase that. Um, I, my amendment in this regard is merely to uh, spell that out. I think we heard a lot of evidence during um, the stages of our consideration in, in the foothills of stage one from a range of stakeholders that they were anxious that uh, other protected characteristics were missing from this legislation. Uh, my um, amendment is intended to address that. Also, so that in, if we do find ourselves in less enlightened times, that no su subsequent administrations or uh, pointing persons could decide that particular characteristics um, for individuals they would choose to appoint over a woman might not be nefarious, like that they were uh, somehow friendly with that person. That was their particular characteristic. So whilst I understand this will be underscored by statutory guidance, I thought it was important to put the reference of protected characteristics on the bill so that um, future administrations, future committees would understand that this was about improving diversity and that that would also signal the direction of travel to, uh, to appointing people and public authorities. Thank you, uh, Alex Go Hamilton. Uh, members want to speak? Jamie Green. Thank you, Convener. Uh, I do thank uh, Mr. Cole Hamilton for this, I think, quite a welcome addition. Uh, uh, however, I perhaps have a question that you may address in summing up, and that's uh, a concern that uh, would the additional wording to include protected characteristics create a scenario where the appointing person is in any, in any way uh, confused as to whether preference or precedence is given to the appointment of a woman or another protected characteristic. I'm not sure that this amendment addresses that potential dilemma that the appointing person may face. And whilst I appreciate that may be detailed in guidance, which we'll discuss at a later part of the debate, um, by not making it clear in primary legislation, uh, are we opening ourselves up to a scenario where uh, it is unclear whether the gender characteristic has greater or less weight than other protected characteristics. Okay, thank you, uh, Jamie uh, Green. I'm going to go to Cabinet Secretary now to contribute to the debate, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much, Convener. I'm pleased that we've been able to work with Alec Cole Hamilton on this amendment, which provides clarity about the operation of <coughs> Section 4.4. As Alec Cole Hamilton has set out in Section 4.4, talks about a characteristic or situation particular to that candidate. Uh, this includes a protected characteristic as defined by the Equality Act 2010. So, uh, if an appointing person is making a decision between two equally qualified candidates, one of whom, for example, is a woman, and one of whom, for example, is a minority ethnic or disabled man, the appointing person could give preference to the man if they consider uh, that to be justified, and obviously that will be discussed further uh, in guidance. This isn't an automatic preference. The appointing person doesn't automatically have to give preference to the ethnic minority or disabled man, but they may do so if they consider it to be justified. Convener to confirm that I support Alec Coles Hamilton's amendment and encourage other members to do likewise. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Alec Cole Hamilton to wind up and press or withdraw your amendment. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, I certainly wish to press my amendment. I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary uh, for her remarks and indeed her support. Uh, I'm also grateful uh, for Jamie Green's question. My it gives me the opportunity to clarify. Um, the questions he asks and and the reasoning behind the amendment. I think um, as it stood, um, well, your question, uh, Jamie Green's question was about clarity and about whether this would confuse things. I think as it stood, um, that part of section four was open to misinterpretation. And certainly I think if we find ourselves many years hence uh, that, that 
we needed that clarity behind it. Um, the reasoning being that if you have right now in the draft legislation as it is before us, before amendment, we talk about a characteristic particular to that individual being the point at which an appointing person could choose that equally qualified candidate over a woman. At that, uh, to me, that feels far more opaque than just saying we need to be clear as to what kind of thing we're talking about here. I think by including the term protected characteristics alongside, and, and I support, um, well, in discussion with the government, my original amendment was to just have it solely saying protected characteristic, but then that might actually and un have unintended consequences of ruling out additional groups who might well improve the diversity of board, people with care experience, for example. Um, I think this is also going to be very complementary to uh, statutory guidance, which will underpin it, which will make it clear um, that the only point at which you would choose somebody who is not a woman over an equally qualified woman would be to improve the diversity of the board. So I think, to my mind, this actually improves the clarity of the, uh, the bill and will give a statement of intent for future decision makers in this place as to what we had in mind. So I press the amendment. Okay, thank you. Okay. So the question is, amendment one be agreed? Are we all agreed? agreed. Excellent, thank you. And the question is, section four be agreed? Are we all agreed? agreed? Moving on to section five, can I call the amendment 11 in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton in a group of its own? Alex Cole Hamilton to move and speak to amendment 11. Alex. Thank you, Convener. Uh, again, I'm very proud to move Amendment 11 in my name. Uh, the reasoning for this, I, was, I found the evidence that we received from uh, other stakeholders and indeed private representations from stakeholders very compelling in the sense that, again, in the spirit of avoiding unintended consequences, um, that we introduce Amendment 11 so that uh, people who, um, both the appointing people and the public authority to whom the duty to take such steps as they consider necessary to encourage applications by women should not prejudice their efforts to encourage applications by other diversity groups. I think this is, uh, the amendment speaks for itself. Um, I don't think it in any way detracts from the overarching aim of this bill, which I think um, I would hope we would all support to increase the representation of women on public boards. But this amendment merely uh, ensures that we don't do so at the expense of efforts to encourage the applications of other um, equalities groups. Okay, thank you very much. Any other members wishing to speak in this debate? No. Nope. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, convener. I'm pleased to support the amendment in Alec Cole Hamilton's name and thank him for giving me notice in advance of him uh, tabling it. I put on record earlier my thanks to the uh, Scottish Trans uh, Alliance. I also at this juncture want to thank uh, stakeholders such as Women 5050, uh, as I said earlier, the Scottish Trans Alliance and Gender, uh, Scottish Women's Convention, Commission for Ethical Standards and Public Life in Scotland, uh, the Equality Challenge Unit and the Universities and College uh, Union Scotland uh, and Colleges Scotland. Uh, in essence, Convener, this bill is about improving the representation of women, women of all ages, women of all ethnicities, heterosexual women, uh, gay women, bisexual women, transgender women, disabled women, uh, as well as those who are not uh, disabled. Uh, women uh, are not a minority. Uh, they are more than half of the population, and it is perfectly acceptable, in my view, uh, to take targeted action to address that inequality. But this doesn't mean that we don't need to take action in other areas too, uh, including to address the underrepresentation of other groups of people on public boards. And in relation to ministerial public appointments, uh, the Scottish Government's public appointments team are already taking forward a range of activity, including in relation to outreach. So there is nothing in this bill to, uh, that precludes action being taken in other areas or in respect uh, of other groups. So I can confirm uh, that I do indeed support the amendment and Alec Cole Hamilton's name. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Alec Cole Hamilton to wind up and press your amendment. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, no further remarks, only to say thank you to the various stakeholder groups who um, helped us get to this point and uh, gave illuminating evidence in the Stage 1 proceedings. And I press the amendment in my name. Thank you very much. So the question is, that Amendment 11 be agreed? Are we all agreed? agreed. The question is, that Section 5 be agreed? Are we all agreed? agreed. The question is that section six be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Moving on to uh, um, guidance. So I call amendment three in the name of the cabinet secretary and a group of its own. Cabinet secretary to move and speak to amendment three. Thank you, convener. 
The committee said quite clearly, uh, both in its written report following the stage one and members stated during the stage one debate, uh, that guidance is needed to support the operation of the Act. The committee also said that it thinks guidance should be uh, statutory and that it should apply equally to regulated and non-regulated public boards. In doing so, the committee has reflected the views of those who have submitted written evidence and gave oral evidence to committee during stage one. The Scottish Government has listened to the evidence presented in favour of guidance and accepts the committee's recommendations. Amendment 3 says that Scottish ministers must publish guidance on the operation of the Act and is also uh, sets out certain aspects of the bill that guidance must in particular cover as the committee requested, for example, section 4.4. And I would like to reassure the committee that we will draft guidance in consultation with public authorities and others, including the Commissioner for Ethical Standards and Public Life in Scotland uh, and the Equality and Human Rights Commission. And I would fully expect that guidance uh, will be shaped uh, by what they tell us during that process. So, convener, I move and urge members to to support Amendment 3. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Members want to speak in the debate. Jamie Green. Thank you, Convener, and thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Um, may I just uh, confirm or clarify a few points? Um, in uh, Amendment 3, subsections 3 and 4, uh, specifically subsection 3, where uh, the wording is that an appointing person must have regard to the guidance in carrying out its functions, it's a, I appreciate that's language which is used in other legislation parts of the legislation, but uh, it does feel uh, that it's open to interpretation as to what have regards to means and what the consequences of not having regards to might mean to the appointing person. So I guess my only concern is that this, would this place any additional statutory um, obligations on appointing people within those organisations uh, to demonstrate that they have regards to the guidance and the uh, any potential negative consequences of being proven to have not having had regard to the guidance. Uh, it's just a, a point of clarification that uh, I would appreciate before we are able to decide on whether to support that particular amendment. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, Jamie Green. Any other members wishing to contribute to this part of the debate? Cabinet Secretary, to wind up and pressure amendment. Just very uh, briefly, Convener, um, Mr Green is uh, correct to say that the wording that's reflected uh, in the amendments is very much uh, the norm. You will see that in countless other uh, examples of legislation passed uh, by this uh, Parliament. Uh, obviously, uh, a guidance gives you the opportunity in cons consultation with stakeholders uh, to explore uh, all the nuances uh, in for further uh, details. But I think when you look at this bill in the round, uh, in terms in particular of the reporting requirements, that's the, um, the route by which people are held uh, to account. And of course, um, that gives that link between uh, outcomes and actions in terms of how people have responded uh, to the guidance uh, have responded to the statutory uh, guidance. Uh, so I don't have anything further to uh, add, convener, uh, other than to uh, encourage members to support this amendment. It is indeed uh, an amendment that was requested uh, by committee and very strong evidence and representations was made to the government, uh, particularly during the stage one debate. And uh, I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much, uh, Cabinet Secretary. The question is that amendment three be agreed. Are we all agreed? Agreed. agreed. Thank you. Section 7 on reports, so I call Amendment 4 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, group with, grouped with Amendments 5, 6 and 7. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary, would you move Amendment 4 and speak to all of the amendments in the group, please? Uh, thank you, Convener. I will indeed speak to all of the amendments uh, in this group and uh, move Amendment 4. The Scottish Government's uh, amendments to Section 7 of the Bill on Reporting uh, are directly in response to the Committee's uh, recommendations. We have introduced a requirement on Scottish Ministers to report to the Scottish Parliament on the operation of the Act in accordance with regulations at intervals of no more than two years. And whilst the Committee asks for annual reports when considering this amendment, I have taken the view that biennial reporting it would ensure that reporting requirements for this Act align with those of the Equality Act 2010 Scottish specific duties. I have also strengthened the provisions on reporting to make clear that Scottish ministers, other appointing persons and public authorities it will be required to publish reports on the carrying out of their functions under the Act. 
Uh, that includes the steps that have been taken to encourage applications from women under Section 5, which I know the committee was particularly keen to see, uh, which Alec Cole Hamilton made representations uh, to the Scottish Government in support of. The Scottish Government agrees wholeheartedly with the committee uh, and with those who gave evidence at Stage 1 that reporting is absolutely crucial uh, to the Bill's effectiveness. Uh, there must be transparency both in terms of the numbers uh, and whether the gender representation objective has been met. Uh, but also in terms of the steps that have been taken, the practical, tangible action that will help us achieve the Bill's objective. So, Convener, I move Amendment 4 and urge members to support Amendments 4, 5, 6 and 7. Thank you very much. Any comments from uh, Alec Hamilton? Thank you, Convener. I'd like to speak in particular um, to Amendment uh, 5. I think that's right. Yes. Um, and I'm grateful again to the Cabinet Secretary for the discussions that we had around this. Um, I think everyone agreed in stage one that we had an anxiety as a committee around the use, the phraseology necessary as it is in terms of the legal uh, requirements around legislation that, uh, that boards, public boards and appointing persons should take such steps as they consider appropriate to encourage women. And I think by... Uh, um, adopting a reporting duty around this will concentrate minds in both camps as to how they <coughs> pursue and execute that duty um, and also it will hopefully um, disseminate best practice as well when those reports are published that uh, boards who perhaps are not doing as much as they could do to encourage applications by women or who don't know how to go about that will pick up on the um, the experience of other boards who are um, delivering that as a matter of best practice. So I absolutely support the amendments in the Cabinet Secretary's name. Thank you very much, Mr Cole Hamilton. Jamie Green. Thank you, Convener. Uh, may I add from the outset that whilst my party did not support the Bill at Stage 1, um, I have made a conscientious decision to actively engage in Stage 2 proceedings so that in the event if the Bill eventually passes, it is in the best shape it can be. I feel that that is the duty of all MSPs to do so, regardless of their stance on the objectives of the Bill. Uh, many of the points on uh, a rationale behind being unable to support the Bill have been extensively outlined in the Stage 1 debate and no doubt will be addressed at Stage 3 also. So any objections to uh, any of the amendments in uh, 4, 5, 6 or 7 today are largely technical in their relation to Sections 4 and 6 of the Bill in its current form, which my party does not support. I would like to ever add that Section 5 is a welcome section. There are many welcome amendments and additions to the Bill today. However, there are pleased to support. On the specifics of uh, Amendment 4, um, in particular, I, I, I felt that I was able to support se subsections A1 to A3, which placed the duty on Scottish ministers to report. Um, however, I uh, was unable to um, uh, support section A4, uh, which uh, placed the duty on the appointing person to publish reports and carry out of its functions under sections 3 to 6, which includes sections 4 and 6, uh, which we are in principle uh, uh, unable to support. Um, so, uh, Amendment 5, uh, in, in a similar vein, uh, and uh, Amendment 6 is a technical one which relates to Amendment 4, so it would seem uh, odd not to uh, uh, group that with uh, opposition to Amendment 4. Uh, Amendment 7, however, seems to be largely technical, tidying up of the language of the Bill to include sections A1 to 1, uh, therefore would be happy to support that particular amendment. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Jamie Green. Cabinet Secretary to wind up. Um, I suppose we should be grateful for Mr Green's continuing interest um, and um, I hope that as we progress with stage two and approach stage three that perhaps he and his colleagues um, can have a, a change of heart. I'm absolutely uh, convinced that this bill is the right, right thing to do. Um, I have nothing further to add on the, the, the substantive uh, issues, uh, convener. Uh, other than to encourage members to support uh, the amendments that have moved and uh, to support amendments 4, 5, 6 and 7. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. So the question is, amendment 4 be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. No, we have a division. So can I ask those who support amendment <coughs> 4 to please show? Okay. And those against amendment 4, please show. <clears throat> and no abstentions? Any abstentions? No? Okay. So the question that Amendment 4 be agreed, the number of votes for is 4. 
and the number of votes against is one, and <coughs> abstentions is zero. So Amendment 4 is therefore agreed to. Okay. I'm going to call Amendments 5, 6 and 7, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated. Cabinet Secretary, can I ask you to move Amendments 5 to 7 on block? Moved on block. Can I ask if any member objects to Amendments 5 to 7 being moved on block? Object, Jamie, yeah? Yeah, OK. So I'm going to put each amendment uh, one uh, after each other. So can I ask mm -hmm. if Amendment 5 be agreed to? Yes. No. So we have uh, Amendment 5. OK, we have a division. So can I ask those who support Amendment 5 to please show? Those against Amendment 5? Any abstentions? No. So the question was that Amendment 5 be agreed to. The number of votes for Amendment 5 is 5. The number against is 1. Zero abstentions. Amendment 5 is therefore agreed to. So I'm going to call Amendment 6 and ask if Amendment 6 is agreed to. Amendment 6, we have a division. Same procedure. Those in support of Amendment 6? Okay. Those against Amendment 6? And no abstentions. Uh, the question is that Amendment 6 be agreed to. The number of votes for Amendment 6 is 5. The number of votes against is 1. And there's no abstentions, therefore Amendment 6 is agreed to. Thank you. Amendment, I now call Amendment 7. Uh, are we agreed to support Amendment 7? Agreed. Agreed? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so the question is that Section 7 be agreed to? Agreed. Uh, the question is that Sections 8 9, Schedule 2 and Section 10 be agreed to. Section 11 is Procedure for Regulations. I call Amendment 8 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with Amendment 9. Cabinet Secretary, I ask you to move Amendment 8 and speak to both amendments in the group, please. Thank you, Convener. Amendments 8 and 9 have the effect of making regulations under Section 8 subject to the affirmative procedure rather than the negative procedure as currently drafted and as recommended by this committee and by the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. Uh, I move Amendment 8. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Any members wish to speak in this part of the debate? No, Cabinet Secretary, I ask you to wind up. Nothing further to add. Thank you very much. So the question is, that Amendment 8 be agreed to? Agreed. Are we all agreed? Can I call Amendment 9 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary already debated with Amendment 8? Cabinet Secretary, can I ask you to move that formally? It formally moved. Thank you very much. So the question is, that Amendment 9 be agreed to? Agreed. Are we all agreed? The question is, that Section 11 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? agreed. The question is, that Section 12 and 13 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? agreed. The question is that the long title be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. And that ends stage two of consideration of the bill. Thank okay. you very much. Can I suspend committee for five minutes to allow for a quick comfort break and for everybody to be back in five minutes because we've not got a lot of time left this morning?
morning and welcome back to the Equality and Human Rights Committee. Uh, moving on to agenda item three this morning, it's a draft budget for 2018-19. Um, we have the Cabinet Secretary uh, to speak to this morning on the Scottish Government's draft budget. Um, the committee adopted a new approach this year by taking evidence and publishing a report before hearing from the Cabinet Secretary. But the Cabinet Secretary has remained with us this morning. And with her this, this morning is uh, two of her officials, Leslie Irving, who's the Head of Equality Policy at the Scottish Government, and Liz Hawkins, who is the Head of Equality, Poverty, Social Justice Analysis at the Scottish Government. Uh, you're both very welcome and, and welcome back uh, to this section of the Committee, Cabinet Secretary. Before we take any uh, questions from uh, Committee colleagues, Cabinet Secretary, I believe you have a, an opening statement on the budget. Yes, uh, yeah, thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Convener. I'm very grateful for the invitation to appear before Committee today as part of the scrutiny process of the 2018-19 draft budget. Uh, and I read with great interest your report published on the 10th of December, which contains some helpful recommendations uh, on budget processes. And I look forward to uh, answering questions and discussing the principles uh, of equality budgeting uh, with you today. As I'm sure committee members will agree with me, uh, Scotland needs to be able to harness productivity, creativity and entrepreneurism. Oh, can't even say that, do you mean? Um, <laughs> anyway, you catch my drift. We need to harness that across the, the whole of our uh, society. Uh, and that is why uh, the key budgetary changes uh, in my portfolio are very much rooted in tackling inequalities and promoting uh, inclusive growth. Uh, and I look forward to answering the committee's questions uh, in relation to my, my own portfolio. Uh, my colleagues uh, across government have made uh, the budgetary decisions in their own policy areas, but I hope that you can see that they've also shown regard to tackling inequalities across uh, health, crime, employment, uh, educational attainment and uh, accessibility. Uh, colleagues will be aware that the draft budget delivered £400 million uh, additional resources uh, investment in health, uh, including an uplift for mental health also. And there are expanded budgets for early learning and childcare and for colleges and higher education, uh, while the attainment fund uh, included £120 million for pupil uh, equity funding. From my own portfolio, funding for the affordable housing programme has increased to £756 million. I have protected funding for fuel poverty and energy efficiency as well as third sector and empowering communities fund. And an additional £38 million will tackle homelessness and social justice commitments uh, such as access to sanitary uh, products. Alongside positive budgets to improve lives, I've also set aside £100 million to protect uh, people from the very worst aspects of UK government welfare cuts, uh, including funding to mitigate the bedroom tax, uh, which we know disproportionately impacts on disabled people. And finally, the equality budget itself has seen an increase of 12%, demonstrating the value uh, that I and my colleagues place in supporting uh, our, our drives towards a more equal and inc inclusive society. And this additional resource uh, will help us deliver on our commitments set out in the Race Equality Action Plan, the Disability Action Plan and our Equally Safe Strategy, among others, uh, and showing our commitment to protecting, respecting and implementing human rights for everyone in Scotland. Now, as in uh, previous years, uh, equality analysis and assessment has been undertaken uh, alongside the budget and was published uh, last week in the Equality Budget Statement. Uh, this is uh, an important document, uh, but we're very focused uh, on uh, demonstrating year-on-year -year, uh, improvements in our approach. And as committee will be aware, this Parliament has passed the Child Poverty uh, Scotland Act, which sets uh, very challenging targets to reduce poverty. And next year, we will receive independent advice from the Poverty and Inequality Commission and will produce a delivery plan to set out how we'll work towards those targets. And this will uh, require action in the short, medium and long term, and it will require aspects of policy and budgets across all portfolios to be directed towards child poverty. It will require good analysis of the barriers and opportunities across issues and protected characteristics, and it will require uh, measurement and monitoring of progress. Convener, tackling inequalities in terms of income is obviously the core of this particular work, but we know that people in poverty, uh, that poverty is higher for disabled people, 
uh, for minority ethnic uh, people, younger people and lone parents. So in tackling child poverty, it uh, will also be addressing wider uh, inequalities. And to me, this is a, an excellent illustration of how we are developing uh, a mainstreamed cross-portfolio policy and budgetary approaches to key problems uh, with equalities considerations built in uh, from the start. Uh, and it's important uh, that we work uh, to evidence how all of this uh, translates uh, in an equality uh, budget statement. Uh, and of course, that's something very much for discussion as we move forward. As in previous years, uh, we've been supported in the equality budget process uh, by the Equality Budget Advisory Group. And I would like to put on record uh, my thanks and the government's thanks to its members uh, for their expertise, insight uh, and indeed the challenge that they bring as we continue to look uh, for the best ways to ensure proper consideration of equality in our budgetary process. Uh, and this year we are particularly grateful for the additional input uh, of one of the Equality Budget Advisory Group members, Dr uh, Angela Hagen, uh, in, uh, given her role into the Parliament's independent review uh, of the budget uh, process. The review group uh, asked the Equality Budget Advisory Group to take responsibility for leading the challenge and asks for equality aspects of the budget uh, and I and my officials look forward to working with them to decide uh, what further analysis and approaches are feasible uh, given available data, methodologies and resources. So thank you very much, Convener. Uh, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. If I'll, I'll come, go with an opening question right now for you, if you don't mind. Um, Obviously, we we, ha we know what the, the budget is for equalities, but you've mentioned many, many other aspects and, and, and cross-portfolio aspects. One of the things that we've picked up very clearly in the work that we've done in the committee and all of the inquiries that we've done is the intersectionality, and where that intersectionality is is where sometimes you find the deepest pockets of inequality. Um, I suppose my question to you, Cabinet Secretary, is how can we ensure in uh, an era of ever-tightening budgets and the challenge on that, um, how we ensure that, that we do tackle some of those intersectionality points and, and where they're at the deepest. And you mentioned one about children with disabilities. Um, we've found some evidence of uh, ethnic minority people who do excel at school but don't excel in the workplace, don't have the same opportunities. So there's many areas uh, in that progression of a young person's life where these things really hit home and if we can solve them at the earliest stage the better so we're looking at you to cabinet secretary to tell us how you intend and your government intends to do that through this budget uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think the point about intersectionality is a very important one. I don't particularly like the word intersectionality, but nobody has uh, come up with a, a, a better description. But I think in terms of how it um, you know, recognises that you can't put people um, in, in pigeonholes, and quite often people will have uh, more than one uh, characteristic. Uh, and you know, we know uh, the issues, that, as you've mentioned, uh, around people living with disabilities uh, having a higher uh, likelihood uh, of uh, experiencing uh, poverty and there are particular issues for, for, for lone parents as well um, and with the publication of the Race Equality Action Plan you know we know that uh, people living in our minority ethnic communities across Scotland are twice as likely to, to be living uh, in poverty. So you're absolutely right, you know, understanding uh, the nuances and being able to have uh, that deep dive is, is very important. And in the debate last week around uh, the Race Equality Action Plan, uh, one of the things that we are very focused on is the, the disparity. Uh, young people from our minority ethnic communities are shining in education, uh, and in many cases they're outperforming their peers, but that's not been translated uh, into their experience in the labour market. So there's work we need to do uh, that understands that particular aspect better, and you'll have seen in the Race Equality Action Plan uh, that there is a, a, a suite, a range of activities uh, around that, uh, and you know it's focused on you know our education and, and skill system you know across the piece. So some of it is about you know entry levels, occupations in and around uh, the work to improve diversity and apprenticeship programmes. Uh, some of it you know is focused on you know people's experience um, in, in higher education and. Uh, you know, when they leave, you know, uh, higher education or college and their experience uh, in, in, in the workplace. And there's obviously funding around the, the, the workplace uh, equality fund as well uh, that, that Jamie uh, Hepburn sees. But suppose a more uh, general point is I think one of the strengths 
of the process we go through uh, to prepare the, the equality budget statement um, is that you know, no other country undertakes the analysis that Scotland does across that range of protected characteristics. And that's where the, the strength is of our current process. Doesn't mean we don't need to uh, improve it uh, further. But, you know, looking at that analysis across the range of protected characteristics uh, leads to that more uh, nuanced consideration of uh, intersectionality. And I think that will also improve, you know, with the introduction of the, the socioeconomic duty as well, uh, you know, with the regulations being laid, that will come into force uh, next um, April. Um, so in terms of, you know, our current processes um, around um, looking at protected characteristics as a whole, um, Scotland being the only part in the UK to introduce uh, the dormant part of the Equality Act and to introduce the socioeconomic duty, um, I think that gives us, you know, um, some advantages in considering uh, socioeconomic uh, disadvantage alongside equality uh, impacts and it gives us opportunities to strengthen our work around that, you know, uh, looking at the connectivity between policy, budget uh, and outcomes. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Cabinet Secretary. Alec Goldhamon. Thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary, again, and, and to the officials. Um, I think our role in this process is, as this committee, the Equalities and Human Rights Committee, is to somehow uh, begin a, a process of percolating consideration of equalities right through all government directorates and, uh, and expenditure. And that, that's the purpose of this, our inquiry and our report, and, and, and I very much hope and welcome uh, the Cabinet Secretary's positive response to that. I think there is always a disconnect between political will and reality. Um, and that's measured out in um, you know, the lip service that's sometimes paid to equalities and human rights by uh, committees and directorates who don't have this as their focus. And so our attention is how do we make that real? How do we pull the equalities agenda and human rights agenda through? And I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary can uh, give us her view as to how much of that actually needs to be backed up by legislation. One of the uh, recommendations of this committee has been the, for example, the incorporation of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child to bake that into our legislative processes. Because right now, for, on that same example, we have um, in the part, part one of the 2014 Children and Young People Act, there was a duty to raise awareness of the UNCRC to all public authorities, but that was met the, the following year with a reduction in the number of um, children's rights officers across the board. So, again, an example of the lip service. So, to ask the Cabinet Secretary, really, are we doing enough, or should we actually be backing this up with legislation like incorporation of certain treaties? I think it's really important that, you know, I don't enter this dialogue in a, a defensive uh, manner. I think for the reasons that I outlined, um, you know, Scotland uh, does lead the way internationally in terms of how um, we publish an equality budget statement at the same time as the, the draft uh, budget is produced, that that is informed by, you know, independent uh, advice and, you know, my earlier comments about um, us looking at the uh, range of protected characteristics. Um, and while I'm proud of that work, I think, you know, we, we always have to have a, a, an eye uh, to how we turn political will into uh, re reality and you know this absolutely has to be uh, a journey uh, and a journey about you know continuous uh, improvement so I think there are things that we can certainly uh, do better and I think there are things we can certainly be uh, explaining um, better. I'm very conscious that in terms of you know mainstreaming equalities um, and having it at the core uh, of our decision making uh, processes that that obligation already exists in terms of the public sector equality duty. Uh, so, you know, the issue there is about how effective is the public sector equality duties. Um, the uh, Equality and Human Rights Commission is obviously reviewing the public sector equality duties. Uh, and as a government, uh, we've uh, gave a commitment to review the, the, the Scottish specific duties that underpin uh, the wider duties. Our specific duties are to help enable public authorities to implement public sector um, equality uh, duties and, and those reviews are important. I suppose in terms of the uh, wider point about uh, incorporation 
Uh, members will be aware of the First Minister's uh, advisory group that is led by uh, Professor uh, Alan Miller, and that group, you know, will be looking at a range of uh, matters, including, you know, the practical steps, you know, that are required towards uh, incorporation, and that. Um, group will report to the First Minister December um, next year. Um, a few other points I'll quickly raise. We do, of course, have an equalities unit in the Scottish Government. Part of their job um, is to uh, help other departments by, you know, getting equalities in at the start. Um, I think that's always, um, you know, a, a journey. Um, our staff survey, the Scottish Government staff survey, um, this year actually demonstrated a high awareness uh, among Scottish Government staff of uh, equality impact assessments uh, and also um, that quite a significant proportion, nearly 20% of Scottish Government staff uh, over the past two years have had experience of working on equality impact assessments. So I think that demonstrates that we're moving uh, in, in the right direction. But, um, you know, as, as always, there's, the, there's, there's more to be done. This is, you know, work that we need to be committed to and we need to be committed to, you know, working through the detail of it all. Thank you. If I may convene it. Um, the other question I had was about uh, how fleet of foot we can be in the equalities and human rights agenda through our spending, through our policy delivery. Um, and that's because, you know, we have a set budget at the start of the year. We know we want to spend in, in certain areas and the direction of travel. But sometimes um, new frontiers emerge in the equalities agenda, and whether that's, say, for example, through the refugee crisis a couple of years ago and the fact that we mm -hmm. suddenly decided as a nation to take 2,000 Syrian refugees, or um, or in areas where we hadn't considered that there was still prejudice which are emerging, either through, for example, the evidence we took around gypsy travellers um, last week, or indeed the, the ongoing debate around gender recognition and, uh, and how we provide for that in our communities. How responsive can the Scottish Government be to uh, the changing landscape of equalities, um, or are we locked in for a year and we'll have to make those decisions at the next budget? Well, I think there's a bit of a careful balance here. I think there is always scope for flexibility. And the example you mentioned um, when uh, the First Minister established the, the Refugee Task Force um, and resource was found, actually not just from the equalities budgets, that resource was found from across government, um, from a range of departments. And you also see that responsiveness to um, international crisis as well. You know, the plea will go out to, you know, departments right across uh, government as opposed to just relying on, um, you know, departments under Ms Hislop's and Dr Allen's sphere where the budgets are, you know, uh, comparatively uh, small. So there is that responsiveness and there's, there's a well-trodden path, um, you know, in terms of how we engage with finance colleagues and, and other colleagues about how, you know, to achieve that and, and of course, be transparent uh, with Parliament um, and in around that. Um, but one of the issues we have um, is that equality groups in the third sector are also seeking certainty. So that's one of the reasons I'm very proud this year uh, to move to three years funding for uh, the equalities uh, budget. So yes, we can be fleet of foot, um, but we do indeed have a budget and a direction of travel because it is only right that we give people that certainty that we have a shared understanding of the priorities um, with, you know, the equalities communities. Uh, they will vary, you know, with different uh, organisations, but I think people also have the right to some certainty as well. So I'm just indicating there's a bit of a balance there. Understood. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alec Cohamilton. Mary Fee. Thank you, um, Convener. When we took evidence in, in a previous session on the budget, um, one of the questions I asked was how we follow the money, because it's very difficult to follow the money um, across different portfolio areas. And I'd be interested, um, Cabinet Secretary, in your view on how we improve that. Because is it about improving um, the, the data that we collect so we can peg the money as we spend it? Or do you think there's a job to be done in this place on, on across portfolio areas on how people recognise that actually money that's spent <clears throat> is an equality issue and correctly um, assess the data from that? Yeah, I mean, I think I would broadly um, agree with that. It is um, comparatively easy in my portfolio 
uh, particularly in the qualities aspect of my portfolio, to demonstrate um, you know, where the money is going and the impact that that's having on um, equalities. It is indeed you know, a, a harder task um, across uh, government, um, not one that's insurmountable. We just have to get the balance right between evidence and action, because we could be spending um, you know, even more time on gathering evidence and evaluating impact. And I'm not for a minute suggesting that we shouldn't be doing that. We do need to do that because it informs that virtuous cycle of, you know, is money being well spent? You need to evaluate the impact and you need to have, you know, evidence about the impact of resource decisions before resource decisions um, are, are made. Um, in the housing side of my portfolio, we've done some really interesting uh, work um, as well about the impact um, of our decisions uh, around investment in affordable housing. So we know, for example, affordable housing uh, and reducing people's living costs has a very uh, positive impact on all uh, the indicators that we need to improve to reduce uh, child poverty. Um, there's work around um, you know, uh, how investment in housing actually increases the tax uh, intake. Um, so I just say that to, to, to demonstrate that you know that there is broader work you know across you know uh, my portfolio and certainly there's work across uh, government a, a, as well, um, but you know we're sometimes limited by the availability or the lack of availability um, of data uh, methodologies and inevitably there's a there's, there's a resource issue. You could spend an enormous amount of resources on gathering evidence and monitoring an impact that we just have to ensure that we're proportionate um, in that so that we're not detracting from the, the actions that we have to be taking. The, the Child Poverty Bill, when, when you mentioned that in, in your opening statement and you talked about the way that's going to be measured yeah. and monitored, <clears throat> is that something perhaps that if that's successful that could be used across different portfolio areas? Now, I'm obviously biased. Um, I think <laughs> the work we're doing in child poverty... Um, I'm probably going to alienate all my colleagues now. Um, but I, I think it's probably one of the best examples um, of a, a cross-government endeavour and the need for a cross-government um, endeavour. You won't uh, eradicate child poverty by, you know, just simply, you know, increasing a few budget lines uh, in, in one portfolio. It really does need to be that cross-government um, endeavour. Um, and you'll start to see that evidenced in our first uh, delivery plan. Um, but there, you know, as with everything, you know, there's a, a, a complexity. So there are um, some measures that give uh, more of an indication of the impact they'll have on targets, and there are other uh, measures that we absolutely need to be pursuing because they solve those broader systemic issues uh, with our, our, our economy and the relationship with targets is less direct but nonetheless needs to be uh, done so you know investment in childcare promotion of living wage you know are big you know uh, systemic issues um, you know within our economy and you know our aspirations uh, around um, inclusive um, growth and there's other you know work um, so you know I mean work around uh, health inequalities uh, work around fuel poverty, you know, as, as, as cross-government uh, as, as well. Um, educational attainment is, is, is a cross-government uh, endeavour, and that's why the work uh, in and around child poverty is absolutely crucial to supporting uh, the work that's going on in education that's focused on teaching and learning in classrooms and resources within schools. We need to be looking at what's happening in communities. But I think in terms of the, the depth of analysis, uh, that we as a government and the Poverty and Inequality Commission uh, are, are now doing in and around um, our first delivery plan um, and how we're going to meet our 2030 targets in child poverty. I think there'll be massive learning uh, across government. And I should say, my final point on, on this, um, I, I apologise for talking at length, convener, um, is that with all of these uh, big challenges such as uh, child poverty, it's, uh, the, the government alone can't do this. So it's what we're doing uh, in the world of work, it's what we're doing to work uh, with local government, it's what the third sector are doing, it's how we can um, 
harness you know the best intelligence from the world of academia to, to, to inform evidence um, you know with these massive issues that face us today it very much has to be that uh, team Scotland approach. Okay, I've got one final question, Convener, if that's yep. all right. Um, you, you spoke again in, in your opening remarks about protected money, and, and we've heard different <coughs> views about whether or not there should be um, ring fencing around uh, the equality budget. Do, do you think that there is a need in specific areas of equality or inequality where there is massive deprivation that more should be done to, to ring fence and protect money? So, the current position is, in terms of our relationship with local authorities and our negotiated position with COSLA, is that we have a presumption against mainstreaming. That doesn't mean there's a ban on mainstreaming, but it does, you know, recognise there's presumption against it and that, you know, uh, we need, needed to revert away from, you know, micromanaging, you know, national government micromanaging uh, local government. And there's, you know, lots of evidence I think would you know support that approach um, in general. Um, specific ministers, um, you know, will have you know an ongoing relationship with, for example, local government, um, and can indeed enter that dialogue if there are things that do indeed uh, need to be ring fenced. Um, so while I hear what Mary Fee's saying, understand what um, motivates uh, that that question. I also think it's important to point to other work. I've mentioned child poverty that, requ that will require different ways of working. Um, but also um, the local governance review as well, um, which is about recognising that, you know, often local solutions to local uh, symptoms of poverty and inequality um, are, are, are best. So I, I think there are ways to marry uh, different approaches. And I think the local governance uh, review will be very interesting um, as it uh, takes shape and we proceed with it. I also think the national performance framework. So there will be a new national performance framework uh, next year. As far as possible with indicators, we'll try and break that down to protected characteristics, but also to place and deprivation. Uh, which I think will help um, in getting all the arrows uh, to fly in the right direction, because tackling poverty and inequality is absolutely essential to getting effective public services. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Thank you. Can I just come in with a quick supplementary uh, to, to Mary Fee's question, Cabinet mm -hmm. Secretary, and it's it's that relationship between local authorities. We, we've, we've had some concern from the work that we've done over the past uh, couple of years about uh, local authorities not completely adhering to equalities processes and certainly um, some concerns about no equality process in their budget setting process at all and some concerns about the quality of the data within equality impact assessments um, and, and, and I was just interested in the comment you made there about the local governance review the public sector equality duty and as what the duty of local authorities are, but how that would work with the socio-economic duty that you mentioned would come into force next year. And you talked about different approaches being married together. So how do we marry those together to make that difference? Because the evidence we see in some cases in the budget setting process at local authorities is that they're not mindful of their equalities duty. So... Um, uh Probably like the convener, I've, I've seen a few uh, variable equality impact assessments in my time as well. Uh, but you know that 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 you know that that isn't me just you know pointing to local government either. You know sometimes you know um, you know within the Scottish government we've you know had to you know relook um, at you know e equality impact assessments and I you know pointed earlier to the fact that you know we've got more staff. Um, that now have experience of doing those equality impact assessments um, and the staff themselves actually consider their understanding, uh, this is Scottish Government staff, understand um, their uh, issues around equality. They feel they understand uh, that, that well. I think where um, the public sector equality duty in the review uh, that's undertaken by the Equalities and Human Rights Commission and our review of the, the Scottish specific duties um, I think will be very helpful in this regard. 
Um, but, you know, we do need to be clear that the public sector equality does put requirements on public um, authorities and we need to be, you know, perhaps at times sharply uh, pointing, pointing that out. Um, and likewise, you know, being able to marry socioeconomic conditions with the public sector um, equality duty, I think, uh, enables that depth of approach and analysis, particularly around intersectionality in the example that the convener gave earlier. But what I also want to point out about the local governance review, that this isn't a two-dimensional discussion between the Scottish Government and local government. And so, firstly, it's a local governance review. It's not a review of local government. It's a local governance review, so it, is, uh, it has the scope to look across the public sector uh, and with a particular focus at a local level. And also that in terms of how we take that work forward, uh, we are engaging communities and community representatives. So it is a broader discussion across the public service and it isn't just a two-dimensional discussion between the Scottish Government and, 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 and local government. Okay, okay. Thank, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Jim McGreen. Thank you, Convener, and uh, good morning again, Cabinet Secretary. Um, in the spirit of time, I will uh, condense... Uh, my comments down to two specific questions um, and I hope the Cabinet Secretary will receive them in the constructive spirit that they're intended. Um, the first is around the budget. Um, uh, obviously this year we're seeing a uh, £2.1 million cash increase in the promoting quality budget which is welcome um, but it is notable that there has been a £3.3 million real terms cut in that budget over the last decade. My first question is if the Cabinet Secretary is confident that the cash increase this year will um, be enough to help meet the uh, objectives of the Promoting Equality Budget. Um, and my second point is around, and I guess adding to the discussion around um, the key players involved in what the Equality Budget is meant to do. Um, I think it's important to acknowledge that, that it's not just central government uh, which plays a part in this, it very much is a collective multi-agency approach. And in that spirit, it's important to recognise the importance that local authorities play in delivering uh, many of the services that the Equality Budget seeks to, such as tackling violence against women, um, social isolation, loneliness, strengthening community cohesion, etc. Um, the Finance Secretary yesterday said that local authorities would need to find efficiencies um, to meet their challenging financial settlement. And I guess my question is, uh, what role do you think the Scottish Government could take to ensure that when local authorities are finding efficiencies, that uh, this does not in any way equate to a reduction in any of the frontline services which are so important uh, in addressing the equality agenda. Okay, um, I thank Mr Green for his question. I hope he'll take my comments in a constructive vein. Um, I suppose the context which we're all working in, whether it's Scottish Government, third sector, uh, local government, um, is that the Scottish Government discretionary budget, um, you know, over the, by the end of this decade, will have uh, reduced by 8% uh, by 2019-20, and that equates to £2.6 uh, million. Pounds. So, you know, we need to recognise that there's a, a real terms reduction in the Scottish Government budget uh, overall. Um, I think it is... Uh, welcome news uh, that we have a 12% increase in the, the qualities budget. The qualities budget um, in you know, previous years has been protected in that it hasn't reduced. There are many other areas um, in, in government where there have been budget uh, reductions, but that didn't happen to the qualities budget. Um, but this you know, is, for the first time in, in, in many years, I, I think a welcome increase. So, uh, you know, the reason for us prioritising an increase in the equalities budget, it certainly is that a large part of the equalities budget goes to support frontline services uh, in violence against women and girls, uh, approaching £12 uh, million pounds of the overall equalities budget. Um, you know, is, is around supporting um, the, either the implementation of Equally Safe, there's about £67 million pounds go to support frontline <coughs> services, whether that's, you know, Scottish Women's Aid um, or, you know, rape, rape crisis uh, centres, um, you know, the length and breadth um, of uh, the, the, the country as well. Um, and in terms of uh, local government, they've had um, a nearly £90 uh, million pounds, uh, increase in capital uh, and a flat cash uh, settlement. So, you know, I think, you know, no, nobody is disputing 
that either our budget or, you know, doesn't have its restrictions or isn't uh, tight. And that, of course, has implications. But I think, you know, going back to the importance of the principles of uh, equality budget setting uh, and the equality budget process, uh, that is very much about helping us to make the case for mainstreaming, uh, about helping us uh, to make the case um, that it's not just the right thing to do, it's a smart thing to do, you know, to address poverty and inequality and to be very focused uh, on equalities. And I think, you know, if, if, if I'm hopeful about the future, it is around that shared ag agenda from local and national government around um, inclusive growth. Um, and that is certainly evident to me and my officials, you know, as we engage with local government and, and, and other uh, partners. There's a shared um, ambition and understanding of the power uh, of inclusive growth, that we need sustainable economic growth uh, that goes hand in hand with tackling uh, inequalities. So, you know, I'm probably a wee bit more, I know, I know um, Mr. Cohamilton <laughs> earlier spoke about needing to um, lock in systems uh, in case you know we encounter less benign um, times <coughs> I suppose you know I'm probably more uh, a wee bit more hopeful in that in that I think there's a real uh, focus in Scotland in and around uh, inclusive uh, growth um, and in that regard the eyes of the world uh, are certainly uh, upon us we'll start to make good progress um, but it's, it's 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 an area where there's much excitement and um, and we can certainly be doing far more. Just to follow up, that's okay. Um, I thank the conversation for that comprehensive answer, and I, I share that positivity too. But I guess my question is more on a practical level. If over the course of the next few months, as local councils seek to sign off their their budgets, if anything was to jump out at the cabinet secretary that in any local authority area there was any proposed cut to a frontline service, that would and it effectively. Uh, reduce their ability to deliver on the objectives of the equality budget or the equality agenda. Um, would the Cabinet Secretary in any way seek to intervene on those decisions or indeed, um, I guess, raise awareness of the fact that that, that, that would be um, quite counterintuitive to the, the agenda which all agencies share in Scotland to, to improve? Uh, so it's more on a practical level if, if there's any commitment to the monitor carefully the budgets of the local authorities as they pass, that, that, that no efficiency savings or reductions or cuts are made to any of these vital services? So, uh, we do have to recognise, um, and I'm very conscious that as a government we are uh, often uh, within our parliamentary chamber criticised for being centralising uh, or indeed over controlling and I suppose with respect Mr Green some of that critique comes from your own uh, benches uh, and you uh, for understandable reasons uh, are asking me how I can intervene uh, to stop democratically elected councils uh, making the dis you know their own decisions uh, if we you know so happens we don't like them so we need to be uh, careful. Um, we have to um, have a, a mature adult approach to all this and uh, with all the players um, in Civic Scotland, whether it's local national government, the third sector, we do indeed have to be having, you know, perhaps some, um, you know, at times quite difficult conversations about unintended consequences and impacts of other people's actions. Uh, this government and local government are, you know, continually uh, dealing with the impacts of uh, so-called uh, welfare reform, highlighted, um, you know, in, in my opening statement that, you know, I spend uh, £100 million pounds across my portfolio uh, on mitigating, you know, the worst aspects uh, of welfare reform and that, of course, is £100 million pounds that can't be invested in, you know, other... Um, you know, equality measures, or housing, or education, um, or, or 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 health. So I'm never adverse to having <coughs> conversations with anyone, uh, and I'm never av averse to people having conversations uh, with me. I'm a big believer in the whole truth to power uh, thing, and but we do have to recognise that local authorities are democratically electable and accountable for their own decisions. I'm accountable for the decisions I make, um, but you know there are other uh, players and there are other politicians that are accountable for the decisions that they make. Thank you. 
Okay. Alec Hamilton. Thank you. Actually, my question segues very nicely from James <coughs> there. Um, and it, it is about the tension that exists naturally between Scottish government priorities and their deliveries by local authorities on the ground. I should say from the outset, I absolutely agree um, with the thrust of what the Cabinet Secretary says about not wishing to dictate what happens in local authorities. But it's just about the principle and the processes that we, um, we make that real and deliver um, what everyone hopes we're going to deliver on the ground. So that started with the presumption against ring fencing in the 2007 Concordat and the 15 national outcomes and 45 indicators, um, which didn't have a very heavy equalities focus, I think it's fair to say at the time, but that's been a process of continuous improvement. That was then followed up with the single outcome agreement planning process in, in the reform of community planning. But one of the things that really consistently sort of stumbled there was, as, and you referenced in your last answer, Cabinet Secretary, the accountability, that local authorities are accountable for their actions. But I, I reference again the single outcome agreement process, and there are many local authorities that would set very ambitious and laudable aims in their single outcome agreements, and then miss those targets by a country mile, and have no comeback, and have no accountability for missing that. And my question is, and without wanting to be heavy-handed as a, a national government, um, are we getting that process right? And is it time we looked again at reforming the ways in which local authorities account to the people they serve um, for the targets that they set themselves and then miss, particularly in the qualities agenda? So, uh, given that the raison d'etre and the thrust of the local governance review at its heart is about promoting inclusive growth uh, and tackling poverty and uh, inequality and pursuing um, the local governance uh, review in an open and transparent manner, an inclusive manner that will engage uh, communities, I do think gets to the heart of this and I think enables um, a discussion about ideas, um, you know, because we've said that we are um, open about ideas that promote inclusive growth. And you can't promote inclusive growth without tackling poverty and inequality and advancing um, equalities. So I, I think that's a, a huge opportunity. I think it's a big uh, gateway uh, into you know some of the issues and tensions um, that need to be un unraveled. But I think Mr Cole Hamilton's, the, the, the key point he made is that how do we um, have systems in place, whether it's reporting, uh, monitoring, you know, whether it's around how the socio-economic duty works in practice, you know, a review of the Scottish specific duties. It's about how local governments are accountable to local communities. And that's where the line of sight is. Um, so, you know, I know I've spoken about it at length, but I do think the local governance um, review um, is, is, is a big opportunity here. I'm, great, I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary um, for her answer there. I think we're absolutely in step on this and, and certainly again it's not about being heavy handed with local authorities. I remember having, before I came to this place, being involved in a sort of a ministerial group around community planning um, and we had this uh, continual discussion about what happens when we agree single outcome agreements which are the contract that exists between um, local authorities and Scottish Government, and then those targets are missed. And, and it kind of came back to the reality that, well, ultimately they are, they are answerable to their communities and their electorates at the ballot box. But I'm not aware of any individual voter who's ever cast a vote in a local government election based on a forensic analysis of what single outcome agreement targets have been missed. So it just strikes me that there is a disconnect in this and that actually... Um, we don't, again, want to call in local authorities to account for how they spend their money or how the, the decisions that they make. But it does feel like there's a weak link in the chain somewhere. So, um, OK, I, I think we te you know, I, I think there's a danger here that we are looking at um, things like outcome agreements as sort of lofty strategies, um, you know, very uh, strategic um, documents. But if you take... Uh, for, for example, there will be many areas, uh, many local authority areas in Scotland uh, that will have a need, you know, a, 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 an acute need to increase affordable housing. So you would expect, you know, affordable housing uh, to be, you know, part of their key uh, objectives. 
Uh, and what we've said very clearly as, as a government um, in terms of working proactively and supportively, it's just one e example with local government around affordable housing, is that we've given them certainty around funding. We've uh, published earlier this year the three years resource planning assumptions. Um, and the allocation of that uh, money is, is tied into is tied into delivery. So if um, particular local authorities were not utilising um, or building enough houses around the resource planning assumptions, we would look to shift that uh, resource to areas which which were. So I suppose that's an example of levers that we do. Uh, and we'd be prepared to use in terms of meeting an overall objective around 50,000 affordable homes. Thank if that's you. perhaps maybe a, 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 a better, a more real-life example. Thank you. Okay. Cabinet Secretary, I've got a couple of quick questions for you and then a more substantive one. Have we got a timescale for the local governance review? Uh, it's in two uh, phases, so there will be um, an enabling group uh, that will be formed at the start of um, next uh, year. Um, so there are two two phases uh, to it, um, and it could it could potentially lead into our future um, proposals around a local democracy bill. Um, and that, that builds for later on in, in the Parliament. But in terms of the specific timings, um, I don't want to, to, to mis mislead you, but it's over the next uh, year or two, um, I'll get that sent to you. OK, thank, thank you very much. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, we heard evidence on the, the role of the Equality Budget uh, Advisory Group, uh, that they should have an individual with a race relations expert background on that and and, and we suggested uh, actually a panel uh, would be uh, more beneficial because if you've maybe got one person from one protected characteristic it opens up the view that there should be someone from every protected characteristic and that could become uh, <coughs> quite uh, difficult to manage but is there any scope within the work of um, the equality uh, budget advisory group of having a panel of people who have protected characteristics who come from the backgrounds and have the lived experience so I hear what you're saying. Um, we need to be very clear that in terms of the job that the Equality Budget Advisory Group do um, requires um, uh, an in-depth, quite technical expertise around budgetary processes and that very uh, acute analysis uh, that goes with that, uh, and um, particularly uh, around socio-economic considerations. So it, th there's a bit of a I suppose what I'm trying to say, a bit of an expert technical job uh, that needs to be done. What the Equality Budget Advisory Group um, has, has always done and has been good at um, is actually inviting people in at appropriate points um, of its, uh, uh, you know, its work. Uh, and I would certainly, be, and I've offered to meet with the Equality Budgetary Advisory Group um, in terms of taking forward uh, the recommendations that the Budget uh, Process Review Group, you know, made in and around um, essentially how, how we become more outcomes uh, focused, um, you know, and I'd be keen to discuss with them how best they, you know, currently do that and in and, and future. I'm, you know, I'm always a wee bit nervous about, you know, creating more groups and, and panels because um, it's the, the Equality Ad 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 Advisory Group, it's not a representative group per se, um, if you can't catch my drift, but I can certainly discuss with them how, you know, at appropriate times they can be, you know, continuing to, to reach out to people who have other expertise in the work that they do around, you know, particular protected characteristics. And, you know, and I think that there is a recognition that while um, through the quality budget statement we've got better at looking through the lens of race, I think you know it's certainly an area that we you know would all want to continually um, uh, uh, improve on as well. Okay, that takes me to another uh, group that the Scottish government's got, and it's a ministerial uh, working group on gypsy travellers. And you would have heard the evidence that we heard uh, a few weeks ago from uh, some of the young people representative of, of the community, especially uh, the very charismatic and detailed evidence of young David Mc, uh, um, uh, 
Donaldson. David, Mac David, David Donaldson. Donaldson. I was going to say David McDonald. David Donaldson, who was superb. But we also heard from uh, uh, Rosanne and, and Seamus McPhee, who have got their own particular uh, uh, concerns. And we've been talking a lot today about intersectionality. And if there's one community where the health outcomes, the education outcomes, the employment outcomes um, are all, uh, you know, in those deep pockets of inequality. How do we use your ministerial working group? But the criticism the people in front of us had two weeks ago was there's nobody there for the community. We work better when people work with us rather than work for us. Um, and that was a message that we heard loud and clear. And we're looking to the Scottish Government to maybe, uh, you know, remedy that in a way that, that the Gypsy traveller community feel that are part of the changes that are being considered for them rather than being told that this is the changes that we think are best for you. Indeed. So you'll appreciate in terms of a ministerial working group that um, the clues in the title. Um, and I was very keen that given, given that we really need to pick up the pace in this, uh, given that uh, your, your predecessor committees uh, had scoped out, you know, a range of evidence. Um, given that, you know, we appointed, you know, the, the race equality advisor, and she had a big focus um, on the work in and around uh, gypsy travellers and tackling um, inequality, I think we now need to take this up to a different level. And if I can be blunt and just say, you know, there are things we need to crack on with. So I think people rightly have the expectation that across government and across portfolio we need to be uh, shown, shown some leadership in all of this and I was very keen um, and I'm glad that my colleagues have agreed uh, to pull together that you know that you know all all ministers and cabinet secretaries have a responsibility in this but pull together um, you know a, a, a smaller group uh, of ministers so that we can um, you know get our heads together and focus on action. Now that doesn't mean that we do that in isolation. I've got um, a series of engagements set up uh, in the first part of next year to you know, to have more direct engagement with the Gypsy Travellers community um, and indeed we've reached out to the witnesses um, that appeared before uh, this committee and I'm very pleased to say that they're keen uh, to engage you know, with myself and my colleagues. Uh, Mr Stewart, uh, over and above that, has separate um, engagements uh, with the gypsy traveller uh, communities. The ministerial working group, it is important that ministers have a bit of space together um, so that we can, um, you know, show some leadership and come uh, to some views. But we will be, um, you know, because we're scoping out the, our, our work programme, but we will be, you know, asking people to come and meet with us either individually or uh, collectively. So it won't be um, uh, an ex exclusive uh, process. Um, a bit like, I suppose, other ministerial working groups that we can bring in experts and folk with you know, lived ex experience um, to challenge us, um, to keep us right and to inform the process um, of every, every step of the way. But I hope um, you know, committee will understand that given that we've had um, a wealth and range of evidence and concerns that, you know, this was, was, was my way of saying, actually, you know, the government's serious about this. Doesn't mean we're not going to continue to engage with people. We'll work very hard at that. Um, but we need to crack on. And, you know, I want a group of ministers round the table cracking on. That's, that'll be really welcome news to, to all, all of the, the committee and certainly the, the people that we're engaging with, with on this because one of the, the aspects of the evidence that we've heard over the years and recently is that this community has been subject to lots of government experiments in some cases and, and, and if we work hard not to go down that route then we might actually make a difference and where we have seen a difference is where local authorities have worked incredibly well South Lanark is a good example of that with the Gypsy Traveller community and a lot of the challenges that maybe other people have in other areas don't don't exist to the same extent because of that joint working. But you've got a community who have been subject to a lot of ministerial and government interventions that have never really included them. They've always just been about them. And if we can change that, that would be very welcome indeed. So, um, we'll certainly be working hard 
um, to include uh, the community. Also picking up on your, your point, uh, one of the things in the Recent Quality Action Plan was to hold um, a, a summit uh, next year, a joint summit with COSLA and local authorities to share the best practice, because there are local authorities that are engaging well with the community, uh, are doing good work. Uh, Fife, um, I'm sure I'm correct in saying that Kevin Stewart has either been to Fife or is going to Fife to look at some of the work that they're doing around uh, the provision of sites, uh, for, for example. So, you know, there are examples of good practice, and I think one of the Ayrshire Councils uh, does quite well uh, as well. And in terms of... Um, there was, there was guidance we issued, um, I think, a year or two ago around um, uh, to help local authorities um, uh, manage unauthorised uh, sites. And there was great, ex great practical examples. And it was one of the Ayrshire Councils, Fife, um, I think also Perth and Conross and South Lanarkshire Council, that, you know, you, you know, the guidance was, you know, uh, demonstrating, you know, that, uh, you know, good practice is um, possible. Um, but we do, we do need to share the good things that work. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. I've got only one final question for the Cabinet Secretary. Has the committee got any other questions? No? Cabinet Secretary, my final question is that you've had a, a pre-budget report almost from, from the committee. Um, is it okay for us to expect a, a response to that in, in the new year once we've got... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It might, it might okay. not be on the 8th of January, <laughs> okay. right? <laughs> but um, I think we'll, we'll endeavour to uh, respond to you as soon as possible. Okay, well, thank you very much, Cabinet. So is there any other comments that you would want to add? No, other than now? to wish you all a very happy Christmas. Happy and to, Christmas. to you too. Thank you very much. Um, that ends that agenda item and before we move into private session can I take this opportunity to thank the cabinet secretary our officials all of the witnesses who have given ev evidence over this uh, this last year the work of the clerks and spice and the official report and everybody who's who supported uh, the committee all of these uh, voices just strengthen yeah. the work that, that we do and we look forward uh, to taking forward some of that work in the new year and we are going to go into private now to consider our evidence from this morning so i now suspend committee to go into private